morning, church. This is the day the Lord has made, amen? amen. And we will rejoice. This is a decision. I mean, so this is it. But, like, oh, what don't we in if you have to move it up or down, whatever. It's good to be in the house. You know, I'm using it, right? Okay, so I'll be right back. Okay.
one of the things I talked to Delir uh, Delorean about is, first of all, baptism does not save you. Amen. The Bible is very clear that you're saved first, and then you're baptized. Bapti baptism is an outward expression right. of your salvation to others. I wanted to, you know, that's a very important point, and she realizes that. It's a testimony to others. But the Bible is not clear about immersion when a person cannot. What I did is I had to do some research and I prayed, I talked to some other pastors, I looked at church history, even in this church. We had a previous pastor, Pastor John McClain, who baptized a senior citizen who could not be immersed in the way that we're doing it today, which is called a fusion baptism. Missionaries who have been out on the field when they do not have enough water to submerge someone, they've also practiced this form of baptism. One of the things I wanted to mention about Deloria is we went over her testimony is because of the dialysis, there's a strong connection between the physical body and your mental outlook. And she's been prone throughout the years of periods of depression. And I can understand, I really I don't understand it, what she's going through. But I can understand how a person goes through periods of depression. And looking at the church this morning, I'm wondering how many Bereans, when DeLorean comes to your mind, or when you see her at church, would just remember to pray for DeLorean. Can you put your hand up this morning? Amen. Delorean, take a look there. Amen. That's your church family. <laughs> They're going to be praying for you. Amen. I talked to Delorean about her faith. One of the things I always want to find out is what her faith is based on. Because a lot of people feel that you have to be a good person to be saved. You have to earn your way to heaven. DeLorean feels that because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that he died for her sins and rose again. That's why she's saved. Amen. When she came here, she's been a blessing to me. When she came here, one of the first things she noticed is that I had a big letter Bible. And uh, I need a big letter Bible, large print. And she wanted one, so we got her one. And she read through the book of John, chapter, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. She's also had some great godly influence. Miss Patricia has been a great influence in Delorean's life. Christ be the glory. And she is saved, no doubt about it, and she wants to be baptized. <clears throat> what keeps her from being baptized? You know, that's, that's how I feel. I want to read a verse in Colossians 2, 12 to 13. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through your faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us our sins. And Baptism is an identification with Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus was buried and rose again, we were dead in our sins and we had victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it gives a story to everyone who witnesses it. So a few questions for DeLorean. DeLorean, do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins he was buried, and that he rose again. Uh, DeLorean, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? So, DeLorean, on the profession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. All right.
praise team come on up.
Amen. Good morning, Berean. Good morning. That one phrase we just sang, I will only boast about Jesus' death and resurrection. DeLorean, this morning you boasted about Jesus' death and resurrection. You proclaimed and told the whole church, you proclaimed that as a testimony, that you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you want to follow him. And I hope the church body will continue to pray for DeLorean in the days that come ahead. Pray for each other. We come to the conclusion of the book of Judges this week. And as I mentioned last week, are all the kids out of the room? This is rated R. You have to be over 18 to be in here today. Okay, I'm looking around. I think we're good. I think we're good. So, a couple of thoughts before the sermon today. And that is, the statement that's repeated over and over and over again in the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. Or everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the philosophy for many people today. Many people today, there's no absolutes. All truth is relative. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. You don't judge me, I won't judge you. And I can do whatever I want as long as nobody gets hurt. Usually they underestimate that last comment though. Because a lot of times people do get hurt. They hurt themselves, they hurt family members. But that's one principle that we see today. The second principle is this. When evil isn't dealt with properly, when evil isn't dealt with properly, it tends to grow. With that in mind, turn to Judges 19. As always, we'll have the words up on the screen behind me as I read from the NIV version. Let's take a look at Judges 19. In those days, Israel had no king. Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem's home in Bethlehem, Judah. After she had been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him his servants and two donkeys. She took him into her parents' home, and when her father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the woman's father, prevailed on him to stay. So he remained with him three days, eating, drinking, and sleeping there. Culture in Bible times, very interesting, very different. A concubine was a lawful wife, but was like a secondary wife in status. She was guaranteed food, clothing, material privileges, but probably not the inheritance. A lot of times, men whose wives were barren and wanted children would take a concubine to have kids with. But the kids would be legitimate, but many times they would not be part of the inheritance. Now, let's make this clear. God does not approve of this. God did not approve of concubines. That's not his original plan. But the Israelites came up with their own laws to, to control it. And really, great men of God actually took concubines. Abraham, Jacob, Gideon, Saul, David, Solomon. They had concubines. Now, it's interesting here that this man, this Levite, initiated this trip back to get the concubines. Some people feel that he might have been part of the blame for her to leave. But take a look at verse 5. 
And the fourth day they got up early and, and he prepared to leave. But the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh yourself with something to eat and then you can go. So the two of them sat down to eat and drink together. Afterwards, the woman's father said, Please stay tonight and enjoy yourself. And when the man got up to go, his father-in-law persuaded him, so he stayed there that night. On the morning of the fifth day, when he rose to go, the woman's father said, Refresh yourself. Wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. Then when the man with his concubine and his servant got up to leave, his father-in-law, the woman's father, said, Now look, it's almost evening. Spend a night here. The day is nearly over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning you can get up and be on your way home. This is a gracious father-in-law. All they want to do is eat, drink, be merry. Let's party for a while before it's time. You have, Remember, this is a Levite. He has a job to do at home, and he wants to go home with this concubine. Verse 10, But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went towards Jabus, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddled donkeys and his concubine. When they were near Jabez, and the day was almost gone, the servant said to his master, Come, let's stop at this city of the Jebusites and spend the night. His master replied, No, we won't go into any city whose people are not Israelites. We will go to Gabeah, he added. Come, let's try to reach Gabeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on, and as the sun set, they neared Gabeah and Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. The first city they came to was Jerusalem, the Jebusites. The Jebusites were a Canaanite people. There were a people that the tribe of Benjamin were supposed to kick out of Jerusalem, and the Benjamites did not obey and did not kick them out. During the time of Judges, it was dangerous to travel during the day, and this was becoming at night. So the servant said, let's not stop where the Jebusites are. Let's travel four more miles to get to Gibeah, that is a town of the Benjamites. And they met at the gate. You know, back then, that was a funny uh, custom that they had. If you needed a place to stay, you'd meet at the city gate or at the town square, and you just stand there, looking hungry, looking like you needed a place. And people would come, and they would invite you into uh, their house. Hospitality was one of the sacred laws of the East. And I, can you imagine, would you attempt that today? I, w I wouldn't recommend that you try that today. But that's what they did back then. But here they were at the city gate, and nobody was helping them. Take a look at verse 16. That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim, who was living in Gabeah, the inhabitants of the place were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveler in the city square, the old man asked, Where are you going? Where did you come from? He answered, We are on our way from Bethlehem in Judah to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim where I live. I have been to Bethlehem in Judah, and now I'm going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me in for the night. We have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants, me, the woman, and the young man with us. We don't need anything. You are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they had washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. Now this sounds like a nice old man. Even though this Levite had all of his own provisions and food, he provided his own visions his own provisions. Do you notice the warning here? Don't spend the night in the town square. It's better that you come with me. Hospitality is big. I, I love the verse in Hebrews 13 too. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. That's always been an amazing verse to me. An amazing verse. 
Take a look at verse 22. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house, pounding on the door. They shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so that we can have sex with him. What does that sound like? Sounds like Sodom and Gomorrah all over again. These men of the town wanted to engage in this homosexual activity, maybe a gang rape, so to speak. Both, of course, the Bible speaks against. And the sinful act that they wanted this visitor to be handed out to them. Take a look at verse 23. It just keeps on getting worse. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, No, my friends, don't be so vile. Since this man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. At least he's got some sense of righteousness, what's right and what's wrong. Verse 24, look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But as for this man, don't do such an outrageous thing. Now, have your thoughts of the old man changed a little bit now? He's not such a nice old man, is he? Yeah, and this is very much what Lot did in Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he offered the same, the same thing. And, I mean, it's just hard to imagine a father offering his daughter to a gang of men. How insensitive, you know, these people were. Let's look at 25. But the men would not listen to him, so the man took his concubine and sent her outside to them. And they raped her and abused her throughout the night, and at dawn they let her go. At daybreak, the woman went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door, and lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue on his way, there lay his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house, with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for home. Isn't that amazing? How insensitive... How revolting that is that this man could even go to sleep at night after sending out his concubine to be gang raped by a group of men. And then he gets up in the morning, she dies on the doorstep trying to get in. Get up, get up, let's go. And there was no answer because she was dead. You know, this is happening 3,000 years ago. But we're going to draw some parallels to today. So let, let's continue reading here in verse uh, 29. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine limb by limb into 12 parts and sent them to all the areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day of the Israelites came out of Egypt. Just imagine, we must do something, so speak up. So he desecrated and mutilated her body and sent 12 pieces, one to each of the tribe of Israel. The fact is, He's the one that sent her out to be killed. He's the one that sent the concubine outside the house to be killed. There was other ways to deliver a message of the wickedness of that town, Gabea. And this was not the proper way, obviously, to spread the message. Let's take a look at verse um, 20. I'm our chapter 20, rather. Then all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and from the land of uh, Gilead came together as one and assembled before the Lord in Mizpah. The leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel took their place in the assembly of God's people 
400,000 men armed with swords. The Benjamites heard that the Israelites had gone up to Mizpah. Then the Israelites said, tell us how this awful thing happened. As bad as cutting up the concubine was and sending them out, it actually worked in mobilizing. 11 tribes sent men in response to this. The tribe of Benjamin did not. Because this town, uh, uh, this town Gibeah, was in the Benjamite territory. So all the tribes sent men except for the tribe of Benjamin. And they all gathered and they were very upset at what took place. And a big army, I mean, you can see here, 400,000 men. Take a look at verse 4. So the Levite, the husband of the murdered woman, said, I and my concubine came to Gibeah in Benjamin to spend the night. During the night, the men of Gibeah came after me and surrounded the house, intending to kill me. They raped my concubine, and she died. I took my concubine, cut her into pieces, and sent one piece to each region of Israel's inheritance, because they committed this lewd and outrageous act in Israel. Now all you Israelites, speak up and tell me what you have decided to do. He's left out some important information, hasn't he? When they ask him what happened, they surround the house, they're going to kill me, they, they, they raped my concubine. What he left out is, I sent my concubine out of the house, I offered her. That's what he's left out. What are the reaction of the 11 tribes? In verse 8, all the men rose up together as one saying, none of us will go home. No, not one of us will return to his house. But now this is what we'll do to Gabeah. We'll go up against it in the order decided by casting lots. We'll take 10 men out of every 100 from all the tribes of Israel and 100 from 1,000 and 1,000 from 10,000 to get provisions for the army. Then when the army arrives at Gibeah and Benjamin, it can give them what they deserve for this outrageous act done in Israel. So all the Israelites got together and united as one against the city. So they're upset, and they certainly have a big, big army. How are the Benjamites thinking? Take a look at verse 12. The tribes of the Israel sent messengers through the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What about this awful crime that, you, uh, that was committed among you? Now turn those wicked men of Gibeah over to us, that we may put them to death and purge the evil from Israel. But the Benjamites would not listen to their fellow Israelites. From their towns, they came together at Gibeah to fight against the Israelites. At once, the Benjamites mobilized 26,000 swordsmen from their town, in addition to 700 able young men from those living in Gibeah. Among all these soldiers were 700 select tr troops who were left-handed. Each of them could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. Israel, apart from Benjamin, mustered 400,000 swordsmen, all of them fit for battle. So the Benjaminites came up with 26,000 men. That's way outnumbered. Now they had 700 special forces. The Benjamites were known as being left-handed. These were left-handed slingshot shooters, sharpshooters, assassins that had great accuracy. And I'm going to uh, speed this up a little bit. I'm not going to read every verse, but let me, let me re read verse 18. The Israelites went up to Bethel and inquired of God. They said, who of us is to go up first to fight against the Benjamites? The Lord rep replied, Judah shall go first. At least they were inquiring of the Lord here. Amen. And that's good. But let me speed this up because I don't want, I'm not going to read every verse today because of its length. But the first battle happened... And the Benjamites won. In fact, 22,000 Israelites were killed on the first day. So the second day, they go out to battle. The Benjamites won the second day. 18,000 Israelites were killed. And you wonder, what's going on here? Now, that's what the, the tribes of Israelite felt. So let's take a look at verse 26. Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel 
where they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there with Athenius, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. They asked, shall we go up again to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites, or not? The Lord responded, go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. And what the tribes did, they took a book out of Joshua in the battle of, of Ai. And what they did is the next day, the Israelites sent out a small number of troops to fight. They came out and they said, day three, another victory. And they started going after the small Israelite army. But the Israelites started to flee. And the Benjamite says, we're going to run after them and chase them and destroy them. So the whole uh, army of the Benjamites went away from the city, chasing the army was on the other side. And when the Benjamites came away, it was an ambush. The Israelites went into the town and burned it to the ground. And when the Benjamites looked around, they saw their city on fire. They were in despair. They looked back, and then they got attacked from this way. They got attacked from this way. And they were defeated. Take a look at verse 46. On that day, 25,000 Benjamite swordsmen fell, all of them valiant fighters. But 600 of them turned and fled into the wilderness to the rock of Rimmon and stayed there for four months. The men of Israel went back to Benjamin and put all the towns to the sword, including the animals and everything else they found. All the towns they came across were set on fire. The big part of this that I want you to realize is that there are 600 Benjamin men that have escaped. And they're living in this area of Rimen, which is a lot of cliffs, steep cliffs, caves. Some of these guys probably still had their slingshots. And they're out there hiding. They're hiding for four months. Now, as we go to chapter 21, the 11 tribes... They're still hot and they're angry, but they start to cool off. But they realize something in verse 1 of chapter 21. The men of Israel had taken an oath at Mizpah. Not one of us will give his daughter in marriage to a Benjamite. They all took an oath. We are so mad at the tribe of Benjamin. None of us are going to give our daughters to them in marriage. But then they realize this. Verse 2, the people went to Bethel, where they sat before God until evening, raising their voices and weeping bitterly. Lord God of Israel, they cried, why has this happened to Israel? Why should one tribe be missing from Israel today? Early the next day, the people built an altar and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Here's the problem. They, they realize we've eliminated a whole tribe of Israel. And with just 600 men left, they're going to become extinct. And they realize as mad as we were at them, we want them to continue to exist. 600 men, but there's no wives, no women. So, let's, let's continue in verse 5. Then the Israelites ask, who from all the tribes of Israel has failed to assemble before the Lord? For they had taken a solemn oath that anyone who failed to assemble before the Lord in Mizpah was to be put to death. Originally, before the battle, they sent word out to all the tribes, we need help, we're going to go against the Benjamins, Benjamites. Obviously, the tribe of Benjamin did not come. But th there is one city there is one city on the east of the Jordan. It was Jabesh Gilead. It was a Transjordan town east of the Jordan. They had not sent anybody to help fight. So, here's the problem. They need 600 wives. Here's a town that did not send anybody. 
This story just gets worse. This, this, this account just gets worse as time goes on. Take a look at verse 6. Now the Israelites grieved for the, for the tribe of Benjamin, their fellow Israelites. Today one tribe is cut off from Israel, they said. How can we provide wives for those who are left, since we have taken an oath by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? Then they ask, um, oh, I believe I just read that already, because it sounds familiar. Okay, so let me go, let me go to verse 10. <laughs> uh, so the assembly sent 12,000 fighting men with instructions to go to Jabesh Gilead and put to the sword those living there, including the women and children. This is what you are to do, they said. Kill every male and every woman who is not a virgin. They found among the people living in Jabesh Gilead 400 young women who had never slept with a man. And then they took them to the camp at Shiloh in Canaan. Okay, you want to find 400 wives? Let's kill two birds with one stone. This town did not send anybody to help us fight. Let's go there and kill everybody except for 400 virgins that they found. And now we have 400 wives. So they're solving the problem by killing more Israelites. Of course, we still need 200 more to go, right? So that, that's part of the problem. So let's take a look at verse um, 13. Then the whole assembly sent an offer of peace to the Benjamites at the Rock of Rimen. So the Benjamites returned at that time and were given the women of Jabesh Gilead who had been spared. But there were not enough for all of them. So they went to all these 600 men hiding in the rocks and the cliffs. And they said, hey, we have 400 women for you. The first 400 down, here's your wives. 200 of you, you're going to have to wait a little while. We're working on it. Okay, so that, that's the situation. Unbelievable. Uh, Someone comes up with a bright idea, though, in verse 19. But look, there is an annual festival of the Lord in Shiloh, which lies north of Bethel, east on the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon. Every harvest time in Shiloh, there is a huge annual festival, and these young women, young girls, would come out and dance in celebration of harvest time. So in verse 20, so they instructed the Benjamites saying, go and hide in the vineyards and watch. When the young women of Shiloh come out and join in the dancing, rush from the vineyards and each of you sees one of them to be your wife, then return to the land of Benjamin. When their fathers or brothers complain to us, we will say to them, do us the favor of helping them because we did not uh, get wives for them during the war. You will not be guilty of breaking your oath because you did not give your daughters to them. Okay. When these girls come out to dance, you hide in the vineyards. Everybody go out and grab a girl. Kidnap them. Take them back to your town. That's your wife. Now, some of the men, some of the men of the town, the fathers, were saying, now wait a minute, we took an oath that we cannot give our daughters to them in marriage. Don't worry about that. It's, it's really semantics. You're not giving them. They're taking them from you. So you won't be guilty of your oath for breaking the oath. They're being kidnapped. It's like, you know, when, when you think about this, so 600 men got their brides. 11 tribes, they kept their vows. The citizens of Gibeah was punished. The tribe of Benjamin was taught a lesson. 12, 12 tribes of Israel survived. The Benjamins went home, rebuilt their cities, and they started to repopulate. Why did all this happen? One Levite, 
didn't have the courage to stand up for what was right and treat his concubine honorably. And just like last week when we were looking at Jonathan and Micah and the Danites, the problem started in the home. And as many people have said, as goes the home, so goes the nation. And this all started because of a Levite who didn't have the courage or the honor to stick up for to the last verse in the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. The book ends. The book ends. You know, it's true today. It's, there's a lot of people today that Jesus is not the king of their life. So they do whatever they want. All the, all the terrible things that happened today. Everybody thought that they were doing right. In America, we like that freedom. We, we like that freedom to do what we think is right. As long as nobody gets hurt. But you know what usually happens, especially when husbands, fathers sin? They get hurt. Their spouses get hurt. Their children get hurt. They get enslaved to sin. A lot of people get hurt. And that's true. It, when sin is not dealt with initially and in a small way, it tends to grow. When God is absent from society, what happens is the strong oppress the weak. You see that in the story today. It's like apostasy and anarchy go together and people just, the strong oppress the weak. And when you think of today, who, who's the weak in our society today? Well, you've got children. You have unborn children. They're weak. You have some minorities. You have the elderly. And, and we as Christians, we have to support and protect them and do everything that we can. What does our Declaration of Independence say? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we need to follow that. So, some concluding thoughts in the book of Judges. You know, whenever pastors say concluding thoughts, that means you got to look at your watch and, and see how much time we have. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to make this quick. You know, when God's people are unspiritual, the nation can decline. And, and we see this. We're supposed to be the salt and light of our society. And when the church is weak, we don't exert that positive influence on society. Uh, C. Campbell Morgan says this, the church did the most for the world when the church was least like the world. Today, many churches feel like they have to imitate the world to reach the world. I thought that was an interesting quote. That the church, we are the salt and light. We cannot hide it under a bushel. No, you're supposed to say, as the song says. But Israel adopted a... a they were so compromising that they adopted the lifestyle of the pagan nations around them. And in many ways, the church has as well. You know, God expects sinners to act a certain way. But compromising Christians, not only do we hurt ourselves, but we also hurt families in our nation. Second thing. Does anybody have any election anxiety? The election is coming up, right? How many days? Are you getting nervous? Well, one thing that Judges shows is that God rules and overrules in history. And the book of Judges makes it very clear that God can work in all types of situations. He can work in uh, ungodly nations, he uses them, and in godly nations. 
You know, he used a lot of uh, opposing nations to discipline Israel for their behavior. He raises up kings. He brings down kings. It's been said many times that history is what? His story. And events that look like accidents are really divine appointments. And as dark as the days of Judges were, God was in control. His purpose was going to be accomplished no matter what. No matter what type of people that he needed to use. God uses government to accomplish his purposes. There was no king in Israel, but God's purposes were still accomplished. And God's purposes can be accomplished in different types of political systems. Now, we all love our democracy. We pray for our, our rights and our freedom, don't we? We love that. But throughout history, God has used people during times of monarchies, dictatorships. God still uses people. Sometimes we get, oh, God can only work if we're living in a democracy. Well, you're limiting God. God's bigger than that. Yes, we want a democracy. We want our freedom. But God can work through any form of government. In Judges, we also see his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness. So many times we see that cycle of Judges where the people sinned and they came before God and they repented. And what did God do? He forgave them and sent a deliverer. I, I, I love the verse that's been often read, especially this time of year. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, God's story is not finished yet you know in the book of judges it's so dark but you know what book comes after judges the book of ruth it's a great book in fact we are going to cover the book of ruth for one uh just one week next week because we see the foreshadowing of better things to come redemption and then comes first and second samuel and we see the king david a man after god's own heart that comes and of course the messiah comes from there Earlier this year, I was sitting at home and I was watching the highlights of the 1968 Detroit Tigers. If you're a baseball fan, that was a great year. The Tigers won the World Series. They were showing it because Al Kaline had passed away and he was a big part of that team. I remember I was a seventh grade boy. I was at school and back in those days, the teacher would pull out the black and white TV and in the middle of the school day or in the afternoon, so we could watch the Detroit Tigers play. It was a big thing. And Tigers were down three games to one to St. Louis. And they had Bob Gibson, uh, Lou Brock, Kurt Flood. Roger Maris was finishing up his career. Things looked bad. As a seventh grade boy, I was in despair. I was so nervous. I couldn't sleep at night. It was gut-wrenching. But you know what? When I watched it this year, I could sit back and relax and enjoy it. You know why? I knew the outcome. I knew the outcome. Tigers won three games in a row and won the World Series. And the reason you know what? The book of Judges is a dark, dark book. Today, our society is going through a dark, dark, dark time. But guess what? I can have the peace of God because you know why? I know the outcome. I read in the book of Judge, I'm in the book of Revelation. I know thinking, you know what? God, I'm serving you, but Nobody is noticing. Nobody is giving me any attention. No one appreciates me. You know what? The only person that keeps the records is God. And, and, and he's the only person that we really should be living for, not so much the approval of others, 
The important thing is that we're serving God in response to all that he's done for us. No Christian can do everything, but all of us can do something. And God takes all those somethings and he puts it together and he accomplishes his purpose by all our little somethings that we all can do. The main thing is that God is still looking for servants today just as he was back then. Now, when you look at the book of Judges, he didn't go to Judges because they were so talented and gifted. Remember Gideon? You know, threshing wheat. He's scared. God used him in a mighty way. God is looking for people that are available and people that are willing to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and to go out and serve the Lord. So there's a lot that we can learn from this book of Judges. And I know it's a dark book, but the story is not done yet. We know the finish. And if you're a child of God, we win. We win. And justice will be served. Let me close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word. Every book in, in the Bible, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And I, I thank you even for the book of Judges that is such a dark book, but yet so many lessons can be learned. We live in dark days today. Lord, heal our land. There's so much hatred and turmoil, violence, people insensitive to life. Lord, forgive us. Heal us, and I pray that you'll continue to bless this great country in the United States of America. We pray this, and all of God's people said, amen. I have a uh, song. Uh, Vince, I know you're going to like this song, because you told me about this song. This is a song uh, that just came out recently called um, Earth uh, to God. So listen to the words.
lord is already here.